What's happening, party people? Riot Starter TV is back again. Yes, 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 yes. Um, it's been a while. It's been a while. Had a whole lot of uh things going on since the last time we popped up on the screen. Uh, shout out to the Remix Morning Show, of course. That if you are new to this channel, every Tuesday through Thursday. We had a remix morning show from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. EST. That's 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. EST. We have a whole lot of uh, powerful content here at Black Power Media. Um, if you are, if it's your first time, welcome. Welcome to the neighborhood. We ask that you subscribe to our channel. Uh, this is a channel where you can catch, you know, everyone from uh, veteran members of the BLA to the Young Lords to Cornell West. Killer Mike, whoever, all things in between. You know what I mean? We try to bring you a different level, a different degree of politics. We also try to keep it as solid as possible because we know that oftentimes we get folks who, uh, you know, like to chat for the sake, sake of chatting. We like to hold people's feet to the fire because of the fact that we recognize that we are dealing with our people's liberation movement. And, um, you know, we don't want to get caught on the wrong side of the barricade. So definitely we look forward to providing more content check us out at blackpowermedia.org blackpowermedia.org or you can check us out on facebook twitter instagram uh, uh twitch and whatever other platform you use to make sure that uh you get the good um i wanted to uh we have a real busy week this week today i wanted to kick it off with a, a veteran and when i say a veteran a lot of times folks talk about former this and former that but most people i know you know that they, they are active and 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 i don't really know any movement dropouts you know what i mean so you know we say veterans because of the fact that we want folks to know that it is it, it is our ogs our original gorillas as we say um so today what i wanted to do is introduce you all because of the fact that we know that there are all types of different folks who profess to be scholars out here and all different types of folks who speak on different topics that they're not well versed or studied. So we wanted to dig in the crates and reach out to one of our elder comrades, brother who's been in the movement for quite some time. He is a legendary author, scholar, and activist. Uh, he's a former professor. He has uh, several books, but two of the books that folks are most familiar with um, in the Black Liberation Movement would be uh, Agents of Oppression, the FBI's Secret War Against the Black Panther Party and American Indian Movement, AIM. And uh, the second book would be the COINTELPRO Papers, Documents from the FBI's Secret War Against Domestic Dissent. And he has so many other classics. But um, And I learned that he will actually be, or they will be uh, reintroducing, reproducing, reprinting, um, both of those books on black classic press starting this january um i will be joined co-hosting tonight today live from morgan state university my man the mellow my man my mellow i mix what i like hey it's an honor and a pleasure i had to try to be here for this i appreciate you letting me join uh, uh professor churchill is is uh, quite an inspiration and legend in the, in, in the game, so to speak. And I'm in my new office, my, okay. my, my brand new unfurnished office. So I, I, I was like, let me, let me, let me see if I could take advantage of that and jump on in here. So it's looking anyway, it's a pleasure, too. man. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's empty. Spiffy. It's clean. It's, okay. it's, you know, so it works. So, so I'm happy to be there. Happy, you know, anyway, so no doubt, but man, uh, Dr. Uh, Jared Ball for folks who are unfamiliar, you know what I mean? Welcome to the platform, brother. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, man, we need to bring the man of the hour yeah. out here because we got a lot to talk about in a little bit of time. Yes, sir. Ward Churchill is in the building. What's happening, brother? Yes, sir. Well, probably same thing happening here that's happening with you. We keep uh, on keeping on. You know what I mean? Hey, man. That's all, that's all we can do. Ward's like one right of on. the coolest brothers you. we know. He just come through like all smooth with the rhymes and everything. You know what I mean? So <laughs> he, he's he's a true MC. So um yeah, so so Ward again, we're we're happy to have you on. I wanted Great to ask you. you for for all the new folks out there and people that aren't familiar, 
I gave you gave him a little uh, abridged version of your bio. But for folks who are not familiar with you, can you give us a uh, an extended version? Oh my, um, Vietnam veteran. Let's start there. So veteran in uh, that sense as well as the sense I think you were referring to. Um, cut my teeth in uh, the original Rainbow Coalition. That'd be Fred Hampton. Actually, uh, Bobby Lee hmm. organized that with uh, Henry Gaddis and Fred Hampton approved it. But that'd be 1969. And I've been trucking ever since. American Indian Movement since... 1972, uh, I was in Illinois at that point still, South Dakota, the northern and central plains region, uh, South Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado for working on 40 years, never really anticipated being uh, living anywhere east of Missouri River again, never even considered the southeast, although I probably should have, because that's where my people are originally from, over in Wilkes County, um, <laughs> east of Atlanta, actually. Uh, I can trace my uh, family's land here back to 1780. So I guess my homecoming, in a way, uh, happened in 2012 after a little in controversy in Colorado, I was co-director of the American Indian Movement in Denver, Colorado AIM, from oh, 1983, 84, in that period, until we reorganized to have a leadership council. Basically, uh, I'm still... Technically, if you want to look at it that way, a member of Colorado AIM, I guess I am, so far as I know, Georgia AIM, but it's not like I've been organizing a name chapter down here. Mostly uh, continuing to do what was my mainstay occupation all through that period, which was writing about... Uh, the truth, the counter to the uh, master narrative of what this country is about, what it means, how it got to be what it is, and so on. Not just from the indigenous perspective, but with regard to all colonized peoples within this entity calling itself falsely the United States. Um, when there is uh, a call for concrete engagement i still try to rally to that so long as it's serious and i'm asked i'm on historically in my own people's land but also i'm in community that is not my own really so i go by invitation i participate as asked do not try to impose if you will and that's where it is with me now. So let me ask you this because of the fact that, you know, um, there are folks who are listening. Unfortunately, we have narrow nationalists in, in all communities. And when you say aim, you know, of course, when we're talking about movement, we take certain terms. We say, ter say take certain, certain organizations for granted because of the fact that we're used to hearing certain things. So um, for folks who are not familiar with aim, what is aim? And what was the purpose of, and what is the purpose of AIM? Well, AIM, the A-I-M, stands for American Indian Movement, which was, uh, and is, still exists, uh, an enterprise, if you will, a upheaval, an insurgency that was intended to enforce the rights to regain, assert the rights of indigenous people. Uh, most evidently, uh, I guess you could say in terms of treaty rights, there's 400 odd ratified treaties, that is the law of the land, according to the sixth article of the Constitution of the United States, that are still in effect. 
and each of the peoples that is a party to a treaty is entitled to the rights that are articulated in treaty, but there's also an implication to treaty relations with the federal government of the United States that is not articulated in the treaty per se. It's articulated in the first article of the Constitution of the United States, um, which is to the effect that the federal government, well, number one, is the only entity in the United States of the United States empowered to enter into a treaty relation with anyone. And it can enter into treaties with no entity other than another fully sovereign government. So the existence of a treaty between the United States and anyone conveys formal U.S. recognition of the fact that the other party or parties to that treaty, the indigenous nations involved in the area that I'm talking about, is a sovereign entity separate from the United States. The United States cannot enter into treaties with subparts of itself. And everybody understands Indians to be subparts of the United States, but the treaties say otherwise, clearly, constitutionally, legally. And that articulation in the Constitution of the United States is not unique. It's reflective of customary international law, even at the time. So that's clear legal standing, articulation of standing. We understand our rights are inherent. Okay, they're natural rights. They accrue to all peoples. That has to do with self-determination of peoples. And that's another principle articulated in international law. And in U.S. domestic law, after a fashion in the 1975 Indian Self-Determination Educational Assistance Act, as they called it, and now in the... Um, Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So that's a way you can parse the distinction between those who stand on Indian rights and those who basically negotiate, equivocate, and ultimately negate those rights, making Indians voluntary subordinates of the United States, nullifying their own tradition, their own rights, their own heritage, if you will. It's complicated at one level and was has been intentionally made that way. But on another level, it's just crystal clear. And that's understood on people on what we've called the right side of history and the rhetoric of the day, You're either on the right side or the wrong side. Okay. We understand the right side of things. And that's been blurred, as I say, quite intentionally. Made to seem far more complicated than it is. And the reason for that is the United States, like any other statist entity, is utterly vested in maintaining its so-called territorial integrity. But to maintain territorial integrity, there has to be some integrity involved in the territory being composed in the first place. And if you look at history the right way, beginning with indigenous people, uh, conquest, if you will, although it's not all conquest, subjugation would be more accurate in a lot of cases. There being hundreds of indigenous nations identified or identifiable Turtle Island, that is to say, North America, in 40 Indian wars by federal comp that have been fought. There were, of course, de facto more than that, but nonetheless, hard to conquer 400 people. Actually, it's more than that, but just using that number, hard to conquer 400 people in 40 wars, if you know what I mean. So it's this perversion of understanding, this deliberately undermining of understanding the obvious and creating a complex interpretation of reality that nullifies reality and comes out with this monstrous result we all inhabit. Mm. Okay. Yeah. 
do you mind if we, you know, you may, I forgot exactly how you phrased it, but, but I'm, I'm very much interested because at the time, some years ago, I did try to follow the case uh, against you at, at the University of Colorado. And I'm forgetting how you just described it, this little incident or whatever as you <clears throat> described it. Could you talk a little bit about what happened there and how it relates to this grand narrative and project being uh, undertaken here? Well, I wrote a non-academic piece. It was actually a blog posting, if you want to look at it that way, for uh, Dark Knight Field Notes, which uh, was an electronic journal, which did have some academic thing, but this was an opinion piece that was written on 9-11-2001, in which I described a number of things, but used a, a phrase to describe some of those in the uh, Twin Towers there in New York as being essentially little Eichmanns who were in the process of consuming third world children in sweatshops and so forth for profit. And uh, they were the technicians of Empire and this enterprise, which I, I think correctly, by any reasonable estimation, determined to be genocidal. And Eichmann's a fairly well-known historical figure in terms of probably the best-known genocide, although by no means the only genocide that's ever occurred, which would be the Nazi extermination of the Jews. <clears throat> that was an error on my part, by the way. Eichmann, I understood to be a figure that the name itself would resonate with people. And I got, I had the uh, Board of Regents, thought it was an anti-Semitic piece. This is testimony at my, um, the trial of a lawsuit that I filed against the University of Colorado and so on. Later in the aftermath of uh, the action I'm gonna describe, it was an anti-Semitic piece because the name Eichmann he took to be Jewish. He had no idea who Eichmann was. President of the university, former U.S. Senator by the name of Hank Brown and one of Lynn Cheney's hatchet men, a uh, founding member of ACTA, said essentially the same thing. Uh, my God, how historically opaque can you possibly be? These people in charge of our, quote, higher educational institutions make a determination of who's qualified to teach therein. Uh, that upset some people. Interestingly enough, it was mostly on the left initially. There was a little flurry of outrage by mostly Marxists in New York, all of whom purported to have had uh, relatives who were <laughs> janitorial staff worked in uh, maintenance in the building, were food service workers and so forth, all of them uh, immigrants from another country, all people of color. I don't know that you could uh, describe those people as the techni technicians of empire, which I clearly did in the piece, but you know, the Marxist flurry passed. They were opposed to, you know, really saying, you, if you do what you're doing to people, people are eventually going to push back and they're going to visit some of what you're doing elsewhere on you in kind and see how you like it. And if you don't like it, maybe you want to stop. That was kind of the point of the piece. Acknowledge what you're doing, change direction. That languished for a while. And then in um, 2004, I agreed to do a talk with Susan Rosenberg, uh, the name may recognize. She's a former political prisoner involved with the PLA and so forth for a while. At Hamilton College in upstate New York, and ACTA, had a representative there that was very active and he pointed out he was aware of the piece that I had written in 2001. And he pointed out to a student editor, 
So it appeared in a student newspaper saying, we shouldn't bring this guy here. You know, he's calling the victims, the innocent Americans from 9-11, compared them to Nazis. Well, it was a particular Nazi that I compared him to, but that got lost in the shuffle. And the Syracuse newspaper picked that up from the student newspaper. So now they had a media role going and Bill O'Reilly picked it up from there. So I was then a topic of interest on um, Bill O'Reilly's program. Now, at this point, people there are people out there listening who probably don't even remember Bill O'Reilly being the top news talking head uh, for quite a while until uh, he got canceled on the basis of uh, some sexual improprieties, let's put it that way. Now, I think he runs a blog himself somewhere and writes or has written for him, puts his name on books about uh, killing Jesus, killing Lincoln, killing Christ. Oh, well, that is Jesus. Anyway, killing things. Uh, he's got a whole series of them that people who are semi-literate really seem to latch on to. In any case, I was 41 consecutive se uh, nights with a segment on Bill O'Reilly. So the Denver media picked it up and the uh, Republican governor was outraged and the Republican Board of Regents was outraged and the Republicans in general were outraged and then Gunny Bob on KOA, uh, Clear, Clear Channel, he was outraged and uh, there was just outrage everywhere. A firestorm of controversy was called and they wanted to fire me um, based on that. But then you had some legal legals from the right uh, step in and say, well, if you fire him on this basis, you know, just on the statement, repugnant though it may be, um, <laughs> you're going to get sued and you're going to lose. So you're saying the right wing came to your defense at first? Because, I, well, because actually, I, I, uh, all I remember is is like Derek Bell and others uh, like that. But No, but, Derek Bell and, and others, that's who the defenders were. These were not people weighing in in my favor. They were weighing in with the university saying, if you okay. proceed on this basis to make a firing, right, you're going to lose. And right, gotcha. that's not the desired outcome. So... A little ad hoc committee of administrators at university decided, based on some complaints that have been filed, and these were from right wingers and morons, that this and that and the other thing I'd said were not true in my academic writing. So then they said they were going to investigate everything that I had ever written and published, which is a pile. Right. Um, at every, insofar as there were recordings available, every public lecture I'd ever given. And so on. They, I don't think ever managed to quite do that, but they locked in on a dozen charges of academic misconduct or research misconduct, as they called it, wow. which would give them then cause to revoke tenure and fire. And this process went on. They secretly uh, brought in a from the law school, a former prosecutor by the name of Mimi Wesson, who had already circulated, unbeknownst to me at the time, the thing about how feminists on campus should rally to uh, my expungement because, you know, <laughs> she compared me to O.J. Simpson and Bob Guccione and, you know, I was in some fairly rare the fight. founder of penthouse they compared you to the founder of penthouse <laughs> and you know what yes who's you doing <laughs> i was busy being male i guess I, he I was exposing know. the nudity and the naked truth of the lies of the yeah of the, yeah that's what it was <laughs> you know like oj you know <laughs> Mr. Yeah, that's wild. Uh, prosecutor law professor blah blah who's saying this, you know, totally ignored the fact that he was found not guilty after a rather lengthy trial. Um, Presumption <laughs> was that everybody would see it as being somebody who had uh, rather brutally murdered his wife and her boyfriend, or his ex-wife, 
Yeah, so a murderer and a pornographer, and there was somebody else. Okay. And she had agreed to chair this investigating committee on the basis that she would be appointed chair and be in sole control of the proceedings. And I'm not going to go through all that. It was ab absolutely <laughs> a travesty. And so I'm found uh, guilty of virtually everything. Okay, I did it all. And then other faculty around the country started filing research misconduct charges against them because some of their findings were obviously false. Uh, <laughs> so I took it to, uh, the next step to the Privilege and Tenure Committee to rehear the thing, the whole thing, review the case. So now we have another whole process. And they struck down several of the uh, things I'd supposedly committed. And meanwhile, the guy I had mentioned, uh, Hank Brown, had been installed as president. The university president, Betsy Hoffman, who was one of the terrorists, apparently, that Obama used to like to pal around with. Um, that's another whole long story. Was forced to resign, and they brought in this guy who was a founder of ACTA, and he reinstated all of the things that PNT had uh, <laughs> dismissed as being unfounded uh, conclusions and sent it to the Board of Regents, several of whom had said from the get go they wanted to fire me. So we had a seven to one vote to terminate, and I filed suit the next day. Jury found in my favor, Judge who was a graduate of uh, the University of Colorado Law School, vacated their verdict on the basis that uh, the regents of the University of Colorado are not subject to legal liability in personnel matters. I was a tenured professor at the time. Um, one could interpret that quite reasonably to say that tenure exists at the discretion of the regents. The judge ruled that even if there was a clear violation of constitutional rights involved in the process, that they were free in personnel manners to do as they wished. So basically, the precedent would void tenure if it was applied, cited anywhere else as well. But at least in Colorado, people holding tenure have no security whatsoever other than remaining within boundaries that are acceptable to the right wing board of regents, you see. And they all stay within those boundaries in their boxes and chatter about this lunatic who uh, challenged the status quo once upon a time and how they're all job secure. Well, as long as you stay in line, you are. As long as you teach people that up is down, right is wrong, in is out, and so on, or you equivocate and provide them a basis to weasel out of any accountability, all is well. So they're part of that enterprise of rationalizing the irrational and depending the indefensible and excusing the inexcusable and all the rest of that. That's the meaning of being a faculty member in a system of higher education at the present time. So I'm presently, I took that to the Supreme Court, which decided ultimately, you know, after I worked my way all the way through the Colorado courts and <laughs> They upheld it step by step, took the U.S. Supreme Court. They required the usual thing, which makes the Supreme Court an impossible um, appellate venue for most people. Uh, they want it. You have to send your filing off to some outfit. There's only one in the country that does this in Omaha, Nebraska for it to be pub essentially published in book form. 
It costs 6,000 bucks to do that. That's just to be able to file. There's some filing fees and such too, but that's the biggie. You got to come up with six grand in order to put the paper in their hands because they won't look at it in any other sense. There are exceptions for people who are incarcerated, write their own, you know, once in a while they will admit something, but this is a standard procedure. And after that requirement was met, then they just decided they didn't want to hear it. So where it stands now is it's before the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which has a thing on, uh, it has provisions on academic freedom. And I feel a little awkward to say the least in having filed on a human rights basis, but Actually, they sort of count on that. Nobody will file because there's much more egregious things going on, you know, with murder and immiseration and false imprisonment and torture and all of that. Nonetheless, this took a while, too. Uh, I think we filed there in 2012 and within the last four months got notified that they had determined that it was actionable, that there were grounds to proceed and uh, we're proceeding. So So nine years later, they've seen it as actionable. And and yeah, it takes a lot of process, anything, obviously. I'm kind of used to that from, I did limited work at the UN in the 1980s. Look, it took us 20 years to get over the insistence of the United States, Australia, and Canada. Oh, and you can add New Zealand. I'll tell you, Roa, you can add that to the list. Uh, whether indigenous peoples could be referred to as peoples in the, the discourse of the United Nations, uh, while they were assessing the need for a declaration of the rights, or whether they had to be referred to as indigenous populations. The difference being peoples in international law are entitled to the right of self-determination. Populations are minority groups within a state population and not entitled to self-determination. So there are 20 years of dispute over that for it was finally determined in conjunction with the uh, race conference in South Africa that the United States would consent to use of the word people so long as there was a caveat attached that use of the word did not convey any standing or rights in international legal uh, terms. So, and that they were not opposed. The United States was not opposed to discussion of self-determination with regard to indigenous people, so long as it was understood and clearly stated that we're talking about internal self-determination, not the right to establish uh, an independent, separate identity, political, economic, and other terms. In other words, you can uh, essentially administer the colonial imposition upon yourself that would be okay. Yeah. That is not self-determination. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know. What does internal self-determination mean? (laughs) Yeah, internal (laughs) colonization is basically what they're saying, but they turn and flip it this way. And that's what I'm talking about. This enterprise of so-called higher education that managed to turn inside out every concept that has substance and meaning. So, yeah. So you 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 just, you've been you've been fighting the long fight for quite a while, you know. That, um, that particular thing, which is a fight I never really wanted to devote time and attention to. And you said, "Come on in." Um, yeah. You know, I, I want to. It, it's so much to. Uh, I mean, woo! It is it, so much. Um, <laughs> I I, I want to like first off. Um, I definitely want to definitely want to talk about counterinsurgency and COINTELPRO as it relates. Um, 
but I can't. Uh, we can't have you on here knowing that yesterday was a uh, a serious day historically that uh, ended yep. up being a federal holiday, and they they changed uh, the name from genocide to murder. Um, so <laughs> I kind of want to talk about that whole thing because of the fact that you know a lot of folks are like okay boom you know they they changed columbus day to uh indigenous people's day and like i said to me it's like okay you know genocide was committed no matter what name you a label you try try to throw on it sure and 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 and, and that's the deal so i wanted to know your thoughts on that whole uh malarkey just that that that, that piece did. First off, it cost them nothing to change the name. Okay. And the issuance of an apology, as Obama did, but it was never really publicized for what you're talking about, which is genocide, although he did not use the term. Right. Okay. An apology costs nothing unless it's attached to something concrete, but the process is ongoing. The appropriation of the land, the resources, uh, usurpation of self-determining rights, all of that is very much in place and ongoing. And there is a, a serious campaign, as there has been, but it's been intensified to subvert indigenous people into legitimating this, signing off on it. And purporting in the process that this represents an actualization of indigenous rights. Again, the world stood, reality stood, all of it stood squarely on its head, upside down, inside out, and backwards. So that when the big issues among uh, good Indians this time is to... Uh, discredit others, other Indians from even being Indian, which has been the objective of the U.S. all along, to minimize or at least corral and control indigenous people. And it was a stated objective of the U.S. turn of the 19th to the 20th century that there be no Indians culturally recognizable as such remaining within the boundaries of the United States by the mid 1930s and then they rolled that back to the mid 1950s but in the meantime you'd had some problems with uh nuremberg precedents and so forth and so they'd altered that and they altered it earlier because they discovered that uh these barren patches of land which they pushed indians into reservations i'm talking about pushed them into it so they'd be out of sight out of mind as they died off in uh, some rather less than appealing ways. This turns out to be, in one of history's great ironies, some of the more resource-rich terrain in all of North America. So then they have to figure out, great capitalists that they are, how exactly to keep uh, those resources and the use of those resources under control so you can have essentially a planned developmental trajectory and reservations are federal trust land so in order to maintain the federal trust over the areas in which the resources resided you need to keep indians in existence so you had the indian reorganization act which ended the uh they said ended the process of uh eliminating indians assimilating Indians and um, absorbing whatever the residue is supposed to look like intellectually, psychologically, and otherwise, just absorbing it into this overburden of population, settler population. They couldn't do that. They had to maintain the trust areas. And, you know, you're talking about serious amounts of resources, some of which we have a premium on not using anymore, like coal. You had humongous amounts of coal places like Black Mesa. There's still a lot of coal there, but there was that, the oil in Oklahoma, which was Indian territory, two-thirds of the uranium that had been discovered in the United States 
in the 1950s was uh, in Indian land, primarily the Grants Uranium Belt, but other places as well. This coincidence between resource deposit and reservation land was rather remarkable. Um, zeolites, bauxite, all kinds of stuff. Industrial grade diamonds. Yeah. And uh, by maintaining the trust, federal trust over those areas, then uh, the government could let the resources loose at, to preferred vendors, uh, <laughs> energy corporations and uh, strategically useful corporations at uh, discounted rates. And because Indians are sovereign, free from EPA regulation, you couldn't be held accountable for things like work for safety and uh, wow. post mining cleanup. And yeah, Indians are far too sovereign for those things to be imposed on corporations. You see, they were playing both ends against the middle the whole time. And now here we are. Well, here we are it has to do with uh, the oil coming out of the ground, the back an oil field up in North Dakota and needed to be piped over to, uh, Wisconsin or wherever it was they were shipping it at the time had to go under the Missouri River and it was going to go under the Missouri River just north of Bismarck but it was probably going to contaminate the water and Bismarck's a primarily white city so they rerouted it south to go just north of the Standing Rock Reservation. Actually uh, the route they chose according to the 1851 and 1868 treaties was part of Standing Rock. Um, somehow now the map makers got it in their head that, uh, the reservation ended the Northern boundary was the cannonball river as it's called. And actually it goes up to the heart river. Okay. So <laughs> the Northern edge of the reservation, they were running the pipeline right through it. And then under the Missouri. So the primary, uh, victims of uh, any pollution of the Missouri River water. And that's the only source of water for Standing Rock to all intents and purposes. If the Missouri water is contaminated with oil leakage, then that's what people are going to be drinking. And that has some fairly dire effects. And it's, you know, Cheyenne River Reservation just downstream, Crow Creek and the others. So you had the... Uh, no dapple, the uh, Minnewatoni water protectors, uh, this protracted struggle in the camps, trying to block the pipeline. And Obama um, <laughs> calling the whole thing to a hold about 15 minutes before he left office, knowing that this guy Trump, who was replacing him at that, he knew that at that point. I mean, the election was over. That first thing Trump would do would be rescind that order and clear the way for the pipeline to be completed. And it was Obama who had uh, not required the uh, environmental, you know, the environmental impact studies that were necessary. They're a matter of law, but basically. They hadn't performed him. They were exempted from that and had proceeded right up to the last minute of his administration. So, you know, the uh, pipeline was run, and now you got another pipeline struggle going on in northern Minnesota, and they're running the same thing. And um, when I say running the same thing, you had armed conflict at. Uh, Standing Rock, not from the water protectors, although there's the one example of Red Fawn Palace, who incidentally is kind of in a traditional way, one of my nieces, um, supposedly fired on the police. The gun belonged to this cop that had infiltrated so I got questions of whether she actually did that. Got no complaints against her whatsoever if she did, but I don't think she did it. And she becomes the exemplar going to prison. But when I say armed conflict, they were oil company, Etsy, uh, in, a, in the pipeline company, 
energy transport systems, whatever, had brought in uh, essentially mercenaries, Tiger Swan and other entities. They're kind of like Blackwater. And rough crew, you know, and they were firing on uh, the nonviolent demonstrators on a regular basis. And you had a woman with all the flesh ripped off of her arm. You had a woman lost her eye. You had any number of people that suffered the impact of so-called uh, non, well, less lethal, they, they say now, plastic uh, you know, rubber bullets. They're not rubber. They're hard plastic. And they'll kill you. If they don't kill you, they'll do serious damage. There's a lot of that munition expended both by the police and by these mercenaries that were brought in. Well, they're doing the same thing in uh, northern Minnesota now on the pipeline contest station that's occurring up there. The uh, pipeline company retained, not Tiger Swan, but other entities have been brought in to perform that service, and they're funding the police. <laughs> Interesting. You got this kind of kind of like back in the Molly Maguire's day in the Pennsylvania coal fields, you know, when the coal company basically formed the police, paid for the police, formed the courts, yeah. paid the judges, the head of the coal company becomes the prosecutor. Yeah. Surprise, surprise, people get convicted, you get mass hangings. Things like that. Well, that's back in the 1880s, as I recall. But here we are in 2021. It's the same procedure that's going on. You know, so. What they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, you know, if, if it's not broke, don't fix it. That's that's the, it's the American way. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's how they get down. And the effect of all the things that I'm talking about, the subversion of identity and the sort of Ganga Den syndrome and the putting the impacts of uh, mineral extraction on into indigenous peoples off of indigenous land. Uh, all of it, this whole trajectory is genocidal. It's because people, as they understood themselves, to no longer exist, ultimately. They can exist so long as they're uh, useful. But the moment they're not useful, the moment they begin to resist, then you bring the heavy hammer down. And, then, and by the way, can I just ask you to elaborate very quickly? Because I, I remember years ago learning from your work. When you use the word genocide, you're not just speaking haphazardly. You're you're no. you're you're working from a legal framework that has been established internationally that even does include, as I remember reading in your work, slow death measures. Yes. Things that are not overt like violence necessarily, but that are things that just prevent cultural uh production, access to clean water, housing, healthcare, all of these again, slow death measures. So yeah, if you could just maybe say a word about that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Raphael Lemkin, who is an exiled Polish Jewish jurist, wrote a book called Access Power and Occupied uh, Europe, published in 1944 by the Carnegie Institution. And then he was retained by the newly formed UN to draft the Genocide Convention, uh, Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime and Genocide. So you, what he produced was the so-called secretariat draft, and you can get that. <clears throat> it's available. And that's where he lays this out, you know, direct killing with the imposition of slow death measures. Uh, the heavy hitters, the major states, U.S., France, Great Britain, and so on, um, basically objected to the secretary of draft the way he had drafted and reduced the whole thing into the form that you find it now. So the genocide convention as it's articulated now is very much truncated from Limpkin's uh, initial concept. 
and he had he introduced the word in that 1944 book at page 78 in a chapter called genocide where he explains it all right and let's start right there with the definition you know and i'm paraphrasing at this point but genocide is as it's explained in that book right there where the concept is introduced any policy undertaken with intent to bring about the dis dissolution of any identified people as such okay i can run that by you again and that's a simplified form where he, he's talking he uses the term nationalities but he's using it in a sense that you don't customarily He's using it in the sense that we use the term people now. Uh, in the Genocide Convention, that's laid out to be any uh, ethnical, racial, national, or religious group. And they had shorn off economic aggregates and political groups. So you get the, that four. There ought to be more, but that's four in law. The slow death measures are included still in the genocide convention. They're not titled that anymore, but uh, I believe it's the third element alphabetically listed under article two is any policy uh, that, that imposes, you know, physical harm on the group. Um, uh, the identified human group, one of those four categories, you know, serious physical harm. So that encompasses all the things he was talking about in slow death measures. The first um, subpart in Article 2, the first A, 2A, is killing members of the group. Now, no, it doesn't say killing some particular proportion or some some particular uh, number it says killing members of the group the premise being of killing members of the group any number of the members of the group simply by virtue of the fact that they're members of the group you listening out there clansmen rednecks goat ropers if you're killing black folks on corners send a message keep people in line that's not just murder it's a genocidal act. You kill them just because they happen to be black. If you're doing that in Nebraska, okay, to an Indian. If you're doing that in Texas, to a Chicano. Yeah. Now that I've got your attention, all you federal and state judges out there, pay attention. That's not simply murder, the genocidal act. Now, they used to say lynchings happened because somebody whistled at a white woman or whatever, cited a cause. But in a lot of these cases, it didn't even bother to cite a cause. You know, it was simply to send a message. And that's genocidal activity, and that's obviously still going on. And incidentally, there's no coloration of law provision in there. It said, you know, this is genocidal action unless it happens to be done with a uniformed agent or a badged agent or a whatever agent of the state. In fact, you know, the lens they're looking at was Nazi Germany and it was agents of the state who were doing this. You know, Germany did not have a traditional lynching like you have in the United States. All right, it was, very well organized statist activity and you had discrimination against Jews, but you did not have lethal kinds of activities directed to Jews prior to the advent of the so-called Holocaust would show uh, as they call it themselves. But it was also targeting gypsies. And once they began the expansion, it was targeting Slavs. And Hitler even named the particular groups that were to be simply eradicated. So it was not a simple process or an exclusively Jewish victim process in any sense at all. And you have that same sort of thing here. 
you know, the notion of the Aryan Superman, Germans, Germanic blood, purity of the race, all of that, that is corollary, corollaries right here in white supremacist dogma that they very much still pursue. They don't call it what they're doing in this country uh, eugenic so much anymore, although there are exceptions that could be named. And there was a guy at Grand Valley State College who was just an outright and proud of it, eugenicist, and, you know, he was there for his career. That was not academic uh, fraud or anything like that. Something you could uh, kind of put up with. Well, he's a little uh, untoward, but, you know, a little too flagrant in his terminology. But if you call it social biology, for example, that would be okay. You're doing the same kind of research. You're writing the bell curve or whatever. See, all of these things play into understanding of genocide because they're all designed to accomplish the same sort of result. Remember, dissolution, disappearance. You check it out. Set out to kill everybody in the group. All right. In fact, you got two criteria that are clearly not lethal. All right. One has to do with prevention of births within a group compulsory sterilization, segregation of sexes, so forth. All right. You're not killing anybody. Well, you had people that would probably argue that for six weeks, you know, since you can detect a heartbeat, there's a human. But setting aside that argument, you're not killing the living person right in front of you. All right. And mostly it's to prevent conception, as in segregation of sexes or sterilization other than compulsory abortion. <clears throat> it could be pointed out that after a single generation, if you impose that, that people is as physically extinct as if you'd lined them all up, shot them in the back of the head and dropped the bodies in an anti-tank ditch, which they were doing plenty of during World War II as well. But you killed no one. So if you make it this synonym for killing, which is the popular notion of what the word means in the U.S., you totally missed the point. And the other one has to do with the uh, forced transfer of children. If you take the children away after they're born and raise them to be someone other than who they are, the people, as such, goes out of existence in fairly short order. Well, that's been standard in U.S. Indian policy for generations. One wonders how Indians end up so intellectually screwed up and bound and determined to uh, work against their own interests, as you see plenty of examples of today. Well, yeah, they've stopped with the residential schools and such, but they have not stopped with blind adoptions. They have not stopped with these sorts of policies that lead to this result. And you have comparable sorts of policies imposed upon well I won't say Latinx I don't know where that came Latinos Latinas okay and against black folk to some extent you have it with uh, well that is another invention Asian Americans people of Asian and Pacific Island origin and so on I remember once having a woman come up to me after a talk in uh, Oakland and almost in tears thanking me for having mentioned Chamorros. Chamorros? Who knows what a Chamorro is? Well, it's the native population of Guam. And Guam's been a U.S. colony since the Second World War. You know? But Talk about erasure, talking about they don't exist in the minds of the colonizing population. You see, that's the point. 
That's the point. That's genocide. Listen, we are live and direct. Ward Churchill, author of Agents of Oppression, the FBI's secret war against uh, the Black Panther Party and American Indian Movement, AIM, the COINTELPRO papers, documents from the FBI's secret war against the dissent in the United States, uh, and, and, and so much more. I mean, we, we're sitting here. I think Jared and I can say that we're in school right now. We're in class. You know what I'm saying? Because of the fact that, uh, you know, you're definitely bringing, bringing the heat. And, and for the listeners, I want to definitely uh, salute Ward Churchill. He's not just a quote unquote uh, intellectual. Uh, we've been in the field. Anytime we call on him and his wife, not Sue, they are there. You know what I'm saying? Been on numerous panels with him. Uh, we've been on, uh, you know, fighting on behalf. We've met Jamil, formerly H. Rap Brown, and a number of other different uh, veteran Panthers and uh, folks from AIM, so on and so forth. So definitely, you know, he's a brother that's not just, you know, sitting on a on a on a pedestal, you know, kicking the Willie Bobo. You can catch him in the field wherever wherever uh, the action is. Um, I want to, I want to, I mean, because there's so much, we can go on and on without even mentioning. In fact, can I just, just very quickly, I just wanted to Please. shout out uh, yes. uh, 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 Natsu uh, Saito, yes. um, not only for her, her, her great work in, in collegiality comradeship with, 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 with her partner Ward, sure. but I did see her in that Atlanta child murders documentary, which was a surprise and a shock, I have to admit. Uh, and we have some some uh, uh, a couple classic interviews with her and Ward at imixwhatilike.org as well regarding her work beyond that. But but I thought that was interesting. I, and and I don't know if we I don't know. It, 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 feel free to. I, I just thought it was interesting to see her in that documentary uh, uh, yeah. to, to be in in a, in a documentary about the, the the killings of these black children, and to be reminded of her and yours uh, long standing uh, uh, ingrained again involved relationship with communities and struggle and similarly colonized struggle so i just appreciated seeing her uh and just wanted to quickly shout that out so anyway sorry to interrupt but go ahead yeah, yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. yeah and, we, and, and she's agreed to come on as well so um right on we're looking at possibly over the next couple months or whatever we'll have her on uh you know dropping you know as well i i mean their, their whole block is uh, off off the hook. I'm not going to tell you about uh, one 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 of the popular neighbors over there. You know what I mean? Uh, from SNCC. Yeah, several. <laughs> yeah, yes, man. I mean, it, right here in Atlanta. So you all the folks who we you know who keep me happy uh, and and hopeful being here in this tragic city of uh, we, uh, Atlanta. Kind of laughingly refer to the neighborhood here as the. Uh, geriatric revolutionary retirement <laughs> <laughs> you got some hitters over there man it's like you know I, I i wanted to talk to you all about doing a neighborhood tour like on this side it's like like you got the, the celebrity tours out in hollywood i think that should wood. be another a, a special episode of riot starter live should be you know a neighborhood the geriatric revolutionary neighborhood, neighborhood tour <laughs> <laughs> i don't want no static but um <laughs> i, I want to uh hop on you know because it's not a lot of new folks out here and um folks talk about counterinsurgency like it's a thing in the past some folks everything's cointel pro that's that cointel pro so what, what i would like you to do and i know you've done it like eight billion times but it's your first time doing it right here um you know talk to the folks what about what counterinsurgency what cointel pro is and the impact that cointel pro has had on uh damn near every movement of the quote unquote 20th century and beyond. Well, COINTELPRO, simplest terms, first of all, it's a cryptonym because it was secret. It would be an acronym otherwise, but it was a, a secret acronym that stands for counter, that's the CO, intelligence, that's Intel program, pro, COINTELPRO. Uh, it's a peculiar kind of counterintelligence program because the FBI's counterintelligence mandate is directed at apprehending the agents of foreign powers, uh, saboteurs, spies, such as that. And 
COINTELPRO is directed at the citizens of the United States, domestic organizations. So arguably, it's a misnomer right from the get-go. They're using the techniques, the methods that were developed to deal with counterintelligence operations directed as they're mandated to do against the agents of foreign powers, but they're directing these domestically. Um, that takes the intelligence aspect the counterintelligence aspect really out altogether. Okay, what you're dealing with then is a counter subversion program at one level, and it mutates, or evolves, it whatever, it always had the capacity, but it's used as necessary into counterinsurgency. But COINTELPRO was the cryptonym used from 1956, that's the INCEPT date for this particular cluster of uh, operations. And then it's discovered, but <laughs> a citizens group burglarizes an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania in 1971 and removes their file paper, which is one of the techniques that the FBI had been using with uh, dissident organizations for generations, really dating back at least to 1940, 41, but I would argue rather further than that, but they call them black bag jobs or surreptitious entries, FBI agents who were some of the best lock pickers in the world because they were trained and they practiced their craft, uh, pretty much with impunity from legal consequence because they were the law, okay? they would uh, burglarize the offices and uh, residences of political targets and remove intelligence information, if you will, okay? Mailing lists, uh, donor lists, financial records, and so on and so on, okay? They weren't taking things of uh, commercial value. They would le even leave money laying there sometimes. They wanted the information. They wanted to figure out who was in, con in contact with who, okay, and why, what they were up to, and so forth. The uh, first, so in 1971, when this, um, among the documents that were taken from that media resident agency office, was one that was captioned COINTELPRO, and nobody knew what it meant. And this sets off the, uh, the burglars, if you will, sent selected batches of documents to journalists at various places. And most of the journalists wouldn't touch them. Okay, because it was illegal to have these classified documents. You had a couple who did run with Betty Metzger and one or two others, um, Anthony Russo. Yeah, well, long story short, that begins to unravel. The first thing that happened was uh, FBI-wise was Jagger Hoover pulled the plug on COINTELPRO, which is to say he pulled the plug on the use of the kryptonym. And what you have to understand, I was talking about black bag jobs, which is one of the techniques that's involved in all of this, dates back to 4041, and that I would argue that it went further. You've got antecedents where they were doing these things. What COINTELPRO did was bring them together under a central heading for central coordination, rather than being more random, haphazard, decentralized kind of operations. Actually, you can trace some of the tactics that are used, the techniques, if you will, back to the Pinkerton agents at the time of the Civil War. Alan Pinkerton was pioneering some of this stuff that was picked up and incorporated into the, the federal approach to things once the FBI was formed by Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I can't go through the whole history of the FBI. But it's also true that they pulled the plug on Kryptonym, but nonetheless, uh, it says right there in his termination order 
won't do this, but, you know, and we need to cut back on some of this because it's been publicly revealed. But, you know, there's instances where the, the techniques can continue to be used, but they need individual headquarters approval before you do it. And the church committee, which is a Senate investigating committee that's convened 74 and 5 to do hearings to investigate what the FBI had been doing. Also, the CIA and the NSA were concerned here with the with the FBI. Um, they said in their final report that they had a half a dozen different ongoing programs that appeared to fit the uh, profile of COINTELPRO at that time, one of which was against the American Indian Movement, and they were getting ready to uh, convene hearings on that when you had the famous firefight at Oglala and two agents are killed, and uh, this leads to the Leonard Peltier case. Uh, they suspended the hearings out of deference to the FBI and its monumental loss of two agents. You got 70 dead Indians on that reservation at the time as a result of the FBI operations there, but uh, they lost two agents, so we'll suspend the hearings. So they're still suspended, you know. The uh, charter for the church uh, committee, the Senate Select Committee, to investigate all this stuff has never been rescinded, so they could. Uh, as Cynthia McKinney, for example, wanted to do, but she, of course, was in the House of Representatives, and uh, it was a Senate committee, so she didn't really have much basis to propel it forward. It could be. She didn't have a lot of support in the Congress either. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Times have changed, and most of the stuff that was illegal at the time by hook and by crook. You know, you got the ninety-six omnibus crime bill that was passed. The uh, Counterterrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act is uh, what they call that guy, the first black president, Bill Clinton. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to Tony That's Morrison. Another, <laughs> another 100,000 cops on the street, Clinton, yeah. and the Patriot Act, which is a cleanup measure. Everybody freaked out about the Patriot Act. And, you know, they're, it's reasonable. Okay, be freaked out about it, but understand that it was a it was a cleanup bill. It was the things that got left out of the important one, which was Clinton's bill, which was had been in effect by that point for six years. By the time you get around to the Patriot Act, the Patriot Act adds pieces that got left out that uh, all the intelligence agencies wanted. Um, but you've also got a whole series of executive orders that begin with Ronald Reagan that basically legitimated all things that were considered crimes in, in the 60s and 70s, and the techniques and tactics that were used uh, illegally to uh, target organizations and individuals committed to affecting social change. And the more radical you get, the more attention you draw, and the more effective you are, the more attention you draw as well. You become targets for neutralization. And... At one level, and this is mostly what the church committee reveals, is that they systematically went about discrediting and disrupting. And they do this discrediting by using a stable of damn near 500 what they called friendly or cooperating journalists to put their names to copy written by the FBI in a lot of cases, but basically told the, the company line and what various organizations was about were about which is how you end up with all these uh, stories hearing over a period of years about how Martin Luther King was a communist, for example, because anti-communism was a big thing. When they started in 1956, the first target was the Communist Party USA, although it had already been essentially destroyed. It was down to, I don't know, something in the vicinity of uh, 2,000 actual members, half of whom were FBI plants and there was a joke at the time you could always tell who the fbi agents were in the communist party because they were the ones who paid dues <laughs> yeah <laughs> if they stopped paying the dues if they exfiltrated there wouldn't be any communist party left but hoover needed it because he wanted this political police apparatus and to 
keep exploring uh, ways and means of combating subversion. Uh, the second one, actually second and third, were added in uh, 1960. That would be the Socialist Workers Party and um, Puerto Rican Independence Movement. King, they never declared, or the Civil Rights Movement in general, they never actually uh, initiated a caption program. They did all manner of stuff that were counterintelligence techniques um, targeting King, including the disinformation and all of that. Um, then you get into what they, well, they, they have one they call uh, white nationalist hate groups which was sort of forced upon them uh, by the white knights of the Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi, taking out three civil rights workers, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, during Freedom Summer in 64. Uh, Mickey Schwerner's parents were big time uh, democratic organizers and uh, Lyndon Johnson supporters and donors and yeah, they were important people in, in New York. So basically, Johnson explained to Hoover, you're either going to go in and find these guys and resolve this, or I'm sending in the damn Navy. And he did send some Navy. So Has that point ever been made clear? You know what? All these years, I don't remember that point being made clear, and I don't remember that being a focal point of any popular films, PBS specials, right, right. anything. This, this, this this yeah. Johnson administration connection to the yeah. three. All we hear about the three legends. Wow. That's, that's you know, well, that's deep. Anyway, my yeah, bad. You got real interesting <laughs> twists that have been put to things. Um, that case was solved by paying $30,000 to a snitch in the Klan who told them where the bodies were. But you also got, uh, if you recall, a film called Mississippi Burning, which was about that case. Joe Sullivan went down, established a, a task force office in Jackson, and they brought in a bunch of uh, FBI personnel, but they did not bring in a black agent because there weren't any. Okay. You remember a scene where the Gene Hackman character had brought in a guy he knew because Hackman understands counterintelligence operations. So they're, they're running a counterintelligence operation against the Klan. He brings in a black agent to uh, intimidate the uh, mayor of Philadelphia, Mississippi, who is also a Klansman, uh, <laughs> threatened to castrate him in the basement. Well, I don't know the exact details of what it was done. There was no black agent brought in for that purpose. Who was brought in was uh, uh, the Grim Reaper, um, Greg Scarpa, who was a particularly psychopathic, uh, homicidal maniac from the five families in the New York. And I don't remember which one he was. He was from Manhattan Island, as, as I recall. So that limits it a bit. In any case, they brought the Reaper in it in he did the job on the, uh, actually, it wasn't just the mayor. Several clansmen just scared the hell out of him. And he did think so, too. So, and then they sent him home. Uh, he was their guy. So, you know, he could perform his mob hits with impunity because he was useful to the FBI. He performed, he's a snitch for him, number one. But he also performed certain technical functions. <laughs> Let's call it that way. Okay. That's not... It's also not something you'll read in the common literature. All right. But if you read uh, the number three guy in the bureau at the time, William Sullivan, Wild Bill Sullivan, who is the uh, assistant director for domestic intelligence and the COINTELPRO stuff falls under him. Okay. And he recounts what happened in Mississippi by fall, he said, they had essentially they infiltrated or turned, you know, intimidated members of the White Knights to the point where they went to work for the FBI. Between the infiltration and turning these various people, they'd essentially taken control of the Mississippi Klan by fall of 64. Then if you look at the record, 
you've got church burnings and all sorts of mayhem that occurs for the next th three, four years at a fairly high level. And the top dogs, uh, you know, the hardcore of the Mississippi clan get acquitted of the murders in state court and then convicted on civil rights grounds in federal court and they're all in prison. And Sullivan's claiming to be in control of that entire clan um, faction, which was reputedly the most violent at the time. And the violence continues. And if the FBI is in control, who's responsible for the violence? And all of the violence is directed at their primary target, which is the civil rights movement, SNCC, and so on at the time. So this, this COINTELPRO is anomalous in the sense that it was designed to take an autonomous entity that was out of control and causing them some problems and embarrassment in terms of um, <laughs> the FBI being compelled to do things it didn't want to do and turns them into a counter in the major counterintelligence operation or set of operations that you're running. So the next is uh, COINTEL Pro Black Nationalist Hate Groups. Well, the SCLC and CORE are both listed as being among the hate groups. Uh, and they're being listed this way because Supposedly, their propensity for violence. The FBI's whole rationale for this is to quell violence. They're not quelling <laughs> police violence, for example, the endemic <laughs> violence of the the order they're attempting to uphold. There is just if there's any response from that side that you know somebody might shoot back at a cop or whatever, then you need to call in the cavalry and press that. All right. And then they have a COINTELPRO New Left, which is pretty much the capstone to things. So you have that set of programs, all right? And when you get to black nationalist hate groups, that's when you shift over into uh, outright counterinsurgency, all right? Not that there is an insurgency as such really going on yet. That sort of helps to catalyze the insurgency. Because the cops are killing Panthers at a pretty strong rate. And killings, I mean, the so-called ghetto riots, the long, hot summers of the late 60s, almost all of them, if you look, you know, the trigger is a cop killing a black guy one too many times. Just gratuitous Rodney King kind of thing. I'm not a Rodney King. Um, Minneapolis. To, George Floyd. Yes, thank you. I'm mm -hmm. having one of those, what they call them, senior moments or senior moments. Too yeah. recent history for this old guy or something, whatever. Amen. It's not like there's not a whole long string of names here that could be invoked. But yeah, um, they weren't trying to do anything about any of that. So this whole notion that their predication was to quell violence or to prevent violence or whatever, particular kind of violence, which would be self-defense or reaction to state violence, whatever. But in terms of techniques, the discrediting, then the infiltration. And you have infiltration and turning people. You, if you can get somebody on criminal charges, then you offer them a deal where they will become an informant within an organization in exchange for the charges being null pros. And you get a lot of that. You get people inside. And they take two forms. One's feeding out information. Okay. And that's in the, in the same venue in a way as the black bag jobs, the, the burglaries, which are going on. And then You've got Ajim Provocateur, people who go in with the assignment, and they usually have a talent for it, of uh, disrupting the internal function of an organization in various ways. One by 
continuously raising ideological fine points to be debated and bickered over, um, more insidiously rumor mongering, so-and-so's skimming funds, so-and-so's doing something with somebody's wife, so-and-so's a cop. This is a technique known as bad jacketing or snitch jacketing where the infiltrator targets uh, usually fairly effective or influential legitimate activist uh, and causes people to suspect, especially people who disagree with them or jealous of them or whatever, to uh, suspect that so-and-so is, in fact, a, a police informer themselves and, and so on. Okay. Then you have this... Uh, well, this is taking the point of trying to instigate uh, armed conflict within certain organizations. That's clearly a thing that happened with the Panthers, which is not to say that there would not have been factual, factional disputes within the Panthers. In any case, clearly there were, but they're much exacerbated by COINTELPRO operatives, FBI agents writing um forged letters and uh, operatives spreading rumors between the various factions about what evil intent um, one group had for the other. So you end up with a, a armed conflict within the Black Panther Party in large part because of that. And there's other examples. You had that to a certain extent within AIM. And it was the least attempted, but that's another story. Uh, to foment that kind of discord between groups, notably uh, between the L.A. Panther chapter and uh, Ron Karinga's organizations, which he insists was simply us, um, was referred to that U.S. as standing for United Slaves. In any case, a um, whole series of cartoons put out in the name of each by the FBI. So Karinga's being ridiculed, humiliated in these cartoons that are being distributed at the grassroots level, ostensibly by the Panthers and vice versa. And you end up with armed conflict there, at least six dead Panthers, according to the FBI's own count. Uh, you've got uh, all manner of extraneous arrests that are worked out with uh, local police forces. Okay, there's collaboration that's been developed over decades with the Red Squads and intelligence units in the local police. Uh, that was used against the Revolutionary Action Movement in Philadelphia in the summer of 67. They were arresting people as fat on any pretext, not hoping to get a conviction or even take them to trial. But as soon as they were bailed out, they'd be arrested again before they were even clear of the jail. Just to completely demoralize people, do you have the extra legal use of the judicial system? They would frame people. And there's a whole series. Like Daruba bin Wahab's name came up a while ago, you know. It's ultimately... Uh, the withholding of exculpatory evidence by both the New York Police Department and the FBI resulted ultimately after 19 years in a maximum security prison and his being released with a vacated verdict. Geronimo Pratt, who is 350 miles away to the FBI's knowledge from the crime he supposedly committed, ended up doing 27 years and you know again there's a whole string and ultimately as fred hampton and bunchy carter and a bunch of others bear witness assassination usually to my knowledge always using surrogates i don't know of the fbi agent personnel actually pulling a trigger on anybody in this sense, but uh, police being manipulated into that situation, um, provocateurs being placed in that situation and so forth. Yeah.
So Hampton Clark assassinations in Chicago being the classic example of that. But those are not the only ones. Not the only ones. That carries forward. That was going on with the American Indian movement even at the time that the church committee was convening. And I have to take a break for a moment, gentlemen, if that's permissible. Hey, please handle your business. Absolutely. Check it out. Yes, yes, yes. So you're checking out uh, Ward Churchill here on the, I see, see Jared disappeared as well. Welcome back, brother. You took a break as well. Um, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we check it out, Ward Churchill right here. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, let me just say that it, it is a, a treat. Um, I've hosted several panels with him, Daruba, and Cynthia McKinney on there at the same time. So you can imagine, you know what I mean, the, the, the fire that was coming from the joint. Matter of fact, I'll probably, I might post one on uh, here, Black Power Media, uh, one that we did some years ago. But um, when we put together the uh, National Coalition to Combat Police Terrorism, uh, the Ruba and Cynthia co-chaired, I was the um, uh, national coordinator and we had Ward and, and a number of other different guns on deck uh, to, to, to carry carry this back to uh to to, hey, to the medical side of things hey and and I, speaking of that i gotta try to see if i i think and i mix what i like dot org it might still be there but i need to try to find because i had audio from one of those classic gatherings convened by cynthia mckinney when she was still in congress yes where she brought ward and others uh to 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 um oh. uh speak on these issues and uh uh you know yeah, in fact, I remember one of them. I, I I was sure I collected the video too. I might even still have that from oh, yeah. from a, a similar kind of discussion where there was an attempt to to uh, bring these you know realities to to a, a wider audience through Cynthia's work as well. So there, I mean, there's there's some gems out there for real uh, uh, that we might be able to to bring to this platform in the near future. But it is always good to get to see you live and direct. Yes. Uh, and hear directly from you. Uh, uh, and I would just say now, since since my, my exit might have to be abrupt in the next few minutes, I just want to say uh, I appreciate uh, Kalanji you hosting this, and 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 Brother Ward, uh, uh, much appreciation for you to you for coming through. Uh, and I look forward to the next time as well. So if I jump off, uh, uh, you know, abruptly, please forgive that and and accept these greetings and salutations, etc. Uh, hey. And it's been great to, to hear you again and see you again. Uh, and I look forward to Same the next here. time. But anyway. Hey, it, it's right all on, good. We, 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 are, we are over time anyway. We'll probably go with, with one or two more questions because of the fact that we definitely want to uh, end it properly. Uh, and, and echoing, you know, Jared's words, you know, man, it is, it is um, deep appreciation and honor. You know what I mean? I, I, I love the fact that you know, um, folks I consider comrades or people that I studied decades ago. You know what I mean? So to to be in the trenches with uh, folks who are actually who have actually put in work for, you know, before this whole social media BS and before all of this, you know, extra <laughs> rubbish that exists, you know, these are folks that you actually had to study and their, their, their research and work. So definitely we, uh, you know, always, you know, props to you, Ward. But I, I want to point out that um, to the listeners and viewers that um, we will have some things coming up in a few days. Uh, for one, we want to acknowledge that this year is the 55th year anniversary to the Black Panther Party. Um, and we will have some uh, veteran panthers and former pps on deck uh just confirm that while we while we're on this show right here right now um so you know um it, it, it's a lot coming up a lot going on we encourage you all to please support blackpowermedia.org uh that is our platform come to our youtube channel uh subscribe like share this particular interview right here I, I must say that this is a monumental one because, you know, I asked Ward to come in and talk about one thing, and we've now gone all over the place, which is, <laughs> which is, which is powerful. 
You know what I mean? So there's going to be plenty of clips coming off this. But um, I, I would like to uh, ask, you know, and, and, and probably one of the final questions would be um, when, when it comes to the whole FBI counterinsurgency program, we know that there were uh, several agents that were recycled throughout the quote unquote mm -hmm. nationalist movement. So I, I would like you to speak on that if possible. We know that Gene Roberts being one of them who was uh, posing as Malcolm's bodyguard and then found his way into the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party. Can you speak on that and how that particular thing from your research went about? Well, actually there was three cops, um, but Robertson, yeah, he had been Malcolm's bodyguard. These were not agents though, they were mm. uh, cops. Bossy cops. Uh, okay. But yeah, Bureau of Strategic Services, uh, I think it what it stood for, uh, the Red Squad, if you will, of the New York police. And Red Squad sounds kind of, I don't know, diminished. This was a serious operation. It was a big one and it was well funded. And they were doing counterintelligence stuff in collaboration with the FBI, certainly. They coordinated and they worked together and they shared intelligence and and so on. Uh, but yeah, he, he was in Malcolm's organization. He um, was on the stage. Actually, he attempted to give uh, mouth to mouth resuscitation to Malcolm, if, if I remember right. He was right there next to Yuri Kochiyama, who had Malcolm's head in her lap. And he was one of the first. Uh, members to show up to sign up for the Black Panther Party when it was established. The chapter was established in New York. And there were three cops who testified in the Panther 21 trial. So their covers were blown. But I think, if I remember right, Bossy had 19 informants in New York. Now, you had a Bronx chapter, a Harlem chapter, uh, branch within the chapter. Uh, you had a one across the river in New Jersey and you had one in Brooklyn as well. I, I think there might have been, if there wasn't a formal branch, there was an operation at least, the Panthers had established in Queens. So you're looking at a big chapter here mm -hmm. and they put significant attention to it. The uh, so that's interesting. I, you know, I just wrote intros for the new editions of Black Classic editions of COINTELPRO papers and agents. And, you know, I just, in that intro is basically I recount the history of the books, how they were put together and, you know, how they have fared um, over time. And when Jim Vanderwall and I started working on this massive amount of uh, FBI paper that we were privy to because we were, did some work in the FBI reading room, as it was called, but that uh, really cumbersome process then and probably more cumbersome now. A lot of this stuff is available online. Online didn't exist at that time, so you had to go and look at paper. But we were working with... Uh, defense attorneys and appellate attorneys that were handling some of these cases. And with Geronimo Pratt, for example, Jonathan Lubell office, I think 190,000 pages. I mean, they just gave me a room with a table, a spray, a Xerox machine, and this pile of boxes that was damn near floor to ceiling. And uh, People's Law Office with the Hampton Clark stuff, Pretty much the same thing, although Clint Taylor provided essentially a guided tour. So it was, I wasn't starting from ground zero with this mass of paper. And so on, so on. When we started going through that stuff, and when I say we, um, aside from stuff that uh, I sort of picked out and Xeroxed or Xeroxed myself and shipped, we're talking primarily me. We both, however, had in mind that we were going to find sort of uh, 
COINTELPRO specialists that uh, would pop up in operation to operation different places in the country at critical times. And we really only found, in that sense, probably one, but all, uh, it's a father's son team it caused me to write an article coming out of that called COINTELPRO is a family business. So there was Richard G. Held, who was an assistant director of the FBI, but was detached from that position to go to Chicago to handle the uh, cover up on Hampton Clark. Once that started to unravel, they relieved Marlon Johnson from his station as special agent in charge and brought in an assistant director to function as SAC and coordinate that which he ultimately was unable to do because, I mean, during the litigation that came from that, you know, the people's law office, uh, Flint Taylor and Jeff Haas were asking for disclosure of the FBI uh, paper that had been amassed on the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party and Fred Hampton in particular and various related things. And their response was, we don't have any. I mean, absolute stone wall. There is no such paper. And then someone from the church committee sent them copies of a memoranda and such, this non-existent paper. And they were able to go into court and say, you know, something wrong with the specter. They don't have any paper, but here's the paper they don't have. <laughs> so the judge who is not favorable to the uh, plaintiffs, not favorable to the Panthers in any way at all. You know, he was exasperated. This was embarrassing. So he said, bring the paper you've got until, he said, it, like within 72 hours. And they came in with hand carts, you know, box after box after box of paper they've been denying having at all. And now in part was Hell's doing, okay, but he got caught out on that. And then he was sent during the Wounded Knee Siege in 1973. He was detached from his detached position to go out and troubleshoot the FBI operation on Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, wrote a very important little uh, paper it was submitted to headquarters called Paramilitary Operations in Indian Country, which they then followed up on. But after uh, the Oglala firefight that I mentioned earlier, and the two agents were killed, he was again sent to Pine Ridge to preside over so-called Res Mers operation when they brought in 250 paramilitarily equipped Huey helicopters, combat fatigue, M16s, the whole bit, APCs. To sweep the reservation, they were looking for the shooters, but basically their purpose was to totally intimidate the population of the reservation at the time. And they did all kinds of stuff while that was going on. So this is what you might call, he was in one sense an architect of COINTELPRO. He was an older guy. He'd been sacked Minneapolis before he was brought to D.C. as a assistant director. So he'd been at it a long time. But his kid, Richard Wallace Held, starts out, and he's a young agent, in L.A., assigned to the Panther Squad there. And uh, he was responsible for a bunch of those cartoons. And after uh, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins were killed, in part as a result of that, he writes a memo about how amazingly successful the operation of the cartoons had been and recommends that a new round be prepared. And that's proved. And then Sylvester Bell is killed by the Karinga organization in San Diego, which is a sub part of the uh, LA chapter. And he repeats that again. 
All right. So <laughs> that's his essentially his first assignment. He starts with COINTELPRO stuff, and he's responsible for some of the most wicked things that are going on in L.A. at the time. He was one of the prime players in framing Geronimo Pratt. He was the one that wrote the letter to the gossip colonists that said that uh, Gene Seberg, who is a prominent Panther supporter, she's funded a lot of stuff. You know, when her pregnancy was announced, he's the one that slipped the uh, information to the gossip colonists that the baby was going to be black because she was carrying on a pair. He said, I don't know whether it's true or not, an affair with Masai Hewitt hmm. in the L.A. chapter. And uh, that led to her miscarriage and ultimately to her suicide, which she attempted on the anniversary of the miscarriage every year after that. And the baby, incidentally, was white, so there were, you know, it was totally a fiction. Wow. But, you know, um, endless sort of <laughs> string of stuff. And he gets later... Not much later, but, you know, Pratt's been put away. The L.A. Panthers are, have been dissolved by Huey. Um, he gets taken to Pine Ridge as part of Resmers, is openly recommending counter, and he's using that term, counterintelligence techniques be used. They shut him up. Hmm. Uh, basically, he received a memo saying, you do not use this term. You know, make whatever recommendations you want to make, but don't be... Term. Right. So, so he's at it there with then it's a whole saga of ugly stuff attached to this stuff on Pine Ridge that we really don't have time to go into at the moment, but it's the same stuff that was with the Panthers, only more so because this is in remote location. All right. There's not many witnesses around. They're field testing uh counter insurgency scenarios and they're referring to aim people as insurgents so we're they're sort of openly acknowledging that we've graduated to counterinsurgency at this point um the whole operation was really mimicked the cia operation with death squads and stuff in the third world um he ends up been promoted to SAC in San Juan. And he was in charge of the island-wide raids that occurred in the 1980s. And then he gets promoted to San Francisco, where, among other things, he's presiding over the uh, counterintelligence operations targeting Earth First activists in Redwood Summer, Northern California, and, you know, the high point of that is the bomb that went off under the seat in Judy Berry's car and damn near killed her. And then they tried to charge Berry and uh, Daryl Cherney with having been transporting an explosive device. They had no history of that at all. Right. <laughs> okay. And if you think about it, that was the same scenario as with uh, Jay Payne and Ralph Featherstone. Right, right. In the H. Brown case in Maryland years before, when the bomb goes off in the car and then it's passed off as being they were transporting a bomb that accidentally detonated and killed them. No, no. Uh, it also, with Los Seis de Lucente in um, Boulder, Colorado, during the mid 70s, when the uh, Chicano activists, student activists that were trying to establish Chicano studies at the University of Colorado twice in a week were transporting mm -hmm. bombs and blew themselves up, took out the entire leadership of the organization in two blasts, one in public liquor and the other uh, <laughs> up on the flat irons overlooking Boulder, where apparently they got up to drink some beer or right. whatever. You know, and no, no one questions it. It's like, oh, this, this is the business. Okay, that's what happened. Well, the one yeah. in Publix, you actually had witnesses that they said that they saw someone toss a package in the car immediately before the, the bomb detonated. So, you know, right, that was right, totally disregarded, right? right. Yeah. So, 
And the last I heard of uh, Richard Wallace held, he was allowed by a judge because a case was brought on this that was ultimately successful. They were able to prove um, that the police had and the FBI had conducted themselves in an untoward fashion in this case. And this was after Judy had died, not from the bomb injury so much as uh, she died of cancer. Right. But held in the middle of that was saying, well, I'm the special agent in charge. I, I wouldn't have reason to know every detail of this as it went along. It would be the case. I mean, he's basically passing the buck down the chain. Right. And was allowed to retire early. Although, you know, you look at his career trajectory, he was being groomed for headquarters. Okay. He was allowed to retire. And the last I heard of him, he was running security for the Visa Corporation. Wow. So, Mm -hmm. hey, capitalism is capitalism. Capitalism, capitalism, capitalism is imperialism. Long history of that, too. People make their bones, establish themselves in the FBI, and then they get offloaded to uh, corporate security or, right. you know, like with the Baltimore uh, Panther case, the police chief and the guy in charge of the Red Squad were both counterintelligence veterans from uh, the FBI. Yeah, uh, a few, few of them were right. Huh? Yeah, no, a few across the board. Um, uh, I can't think of the cat's name that ended up here in Atlanta over over um, over the NSA here. You know, um, uh, police chief. Um, oh, I, I, I believe he was from uh, L.A. Am I thinking? I'm, I'm I'm almost certain. Yeah, could be off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't think of his name right now, but you know, I mean. It's, it's all around the world, same song. I, I want to say, um, first of all, we can go on for hours. Uh, and I want to definitely thank you for stopping through. We want to uh, definitely salute um, our apprentice, Bunchy Carter, whose birthday would have been today. Um, really? You know, yes, yes, yes. So, you know, salute to him. If you're not familiar with Bunchy, Par Bunchy Carter and uh, Captain John Huggins, make sure... You look them up. They were victims of uh, a situation that Ward mentioned earlier, uh, the, the situation between us and uh, with uh, Karanga and the Black Panther, L.A. chapter, the Black Panther Party. You know, definitely look that up. Um, share this particular video. Like it. Uh, subscribe, as we just mentioned. I'm looking forward to bringing you back on again soon, Ward, if, uh, if, if you don't mind chatting with a uh, uh, a young rebel like me. You know what I'm, <laughs> well, I'm only 29, man. Come on. You're only 29? Hey, yeah. man. You know? <laughs> Never trust anybody over 30. Hey, boy, look at it, 40. Man. Hey, man. Uh, how about 50? You, you, 50? You, 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 you sound like you about to start a new Facebook page or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have to not trust anybody over 70 or 80 or something. Man, look here, man. Hey, hey. Nowadays, you can hardly trust anybody you can't see. You know what I'm saying? If you haven't, <laughs> you haven't organized with them. You you haven't uh, broken bread with them. And and that's that's one of the most important things about organizing. Uh, I know different folks, you know, talk about being a part of organizations, but more than being a part of organizations, you have to get to know your comrades. You got to know where they live. You got to know their children. You got to know their families. You know what I'm saying? Because of the fact that you have to have a yep. vested interest. It's not just you just pop up and, you know, you disappear. It's not that type of party. You know, we, we have to know each other and understand the um, the importance of, of, of camaraderie, the importance of having comrades and the importance of political education. So, um, you know, with that being said, Ward, definitely... Uh, Always an honor, always a pleasure. You know what I mean? To uh, you know, I'm always learning something new. Just when I think, oh, okay, I not heard everything Ward had to say. You come out with like uh, two more volumes. Every time <laughs> you... <laughs> yeah, every well, time you see, yeah, yeah. You know, so we definitely, uh, man, I appreciate you, brother. You know, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. How are you? No uh, doubt. Otherwise, I'd be sitting here talking to myself, wouldn't I? Hey man, <laughs> please come on, man. Between you and Natsu, I'm sure I'm sure 
you know, I mean, you, you all now mapped out a whole new world, you know. So, so definitely, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> you know. I think maybe in a negative sense, yeah. In a negative sense. Yeah. Amen. This is what you don't want to have for your world. Hey. Go hey. the opposite direction. America is taught as well. Hey, again, man, salute, and we'll be talking to you soon. Okay. No doubt. Take care now. You too. You've been checking out Riot Starter TV with our guest, Ward Churchill. Um, again, some of you might have just stopped through, and you may not just yet know what you were a part of. So I want you to go ahead and make sure, if you're talking about a book list, you make sure that you check out, Google his name and check out a list of uh, some of the, uh, the treats he has to offer. Uh, definitely glad to hear that Black Classic Press will be re-releasing uh, two of their classic works um, in January. I don't know the, the, the exact date, but stay tuned to Black Power Media. We will be, you know, making sure that we, uh, you know, highlight it and, and maybe have them come back on and talk about, you know, the importance of it. But uh, we definitely appreciate you. Again, share this. Um, uh, go to YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, subscribe and, uh, you know, stay on the right side of the barricades. Stay ready for revolution. So what it's all about. Riot Starter TV. Oh, check me out tomorrow, 2 p.m. We'll have attorney Tierney Sheree on, African Esquire, and we'll be talking about her uh, solid book that she has out, okay, dealing with children and the whole system of welfare. Anyway, Riot Starter TV, Black Power Media, we out of here. Salute. <laughs>